I'm Matt Nelson, and I conducted an original research, and the title was The Influence of Unilateral Pelvic Rotation on Upper Leg Musculoskeletal Injuries in Collegiate Mouse Soccer Players. So just an overview of what I'm going to go through. It's going to be my clinical question, my hypothesis, subjects, testing procedures, results, and conclusion from study. So this past semester, I was one of the student athletic trainers for the Emory & Henry men's soccer team. And as the season progressed, I started noticing a trend that more than half of the athletes were experiencing or had experienced an upper leg muscular injury. Um, after further evaluation, it uh, kind of stuck, um, stuck out to me, I guess, or stood out to me, that a majority of them had a pelvic malalignment. And this led me to my clinical question of, does unilateral pelvic rotation have an influence on upper leg musculoskeletal injuries in collegiate male soccer players? So after coming up with my research question, I tried looking up as much information that I could find. And most everything that I found dealt with the ankle, the knee, or the lower leg, and nothing with the upper leg. So it didn't take me long to realize that this topic had been neglected by the research community. So from the little information that was available and the evidence that I found, um, I came up with my hypothesis of I believe that a unilateral pelvic rotation does have a strong influence on upper leg musculoskeletal injuries in collegiate male soccer players. So for the subject, I used the Emory Henry men's soccer team. There were 27 participants that ranged in age from 18 to 23. There were 11 freshmen, 8 sophomores, there was only 1 junior, and 7 seniors. And the number of years playing competitive soccer ranged from 5 to 16. So for my testing procedures, this is kind of an overview. The questionnaire, leg length, thigh girth, range of motion, pelvic alignment, and pelvic rotation. And I'm going to go through each one of these. So for the questionnaires, when the athletes walked into the athletic training room, I handed them a brief questionnaire that asked their age, weight, height, position, their kicking leg, or their dominant leg, number of years playing competitive soccer, and any previous injuries to their lower extremities. So after they answered this, I just used a regular tape measure and measured their true leg length and apparent leg length. And I did this to look for any leg length discrepancies. So I used the same tape measure to do thigh girth. And I measured halfway between their ASIS and their patella. And what I wanted to do with these measurements was look at any muscular imbalances between their dominant leg and their non-dominant leg. I then measured active range of motion um, and wanted to look at flexibility differences between their dominant leg and their non-dominant leg. And I measured active range of motion for hip flexion, extension, internal and external rotation, and AB and adduction. So following that, I, did, I wanted to look at pelvic alignment. And to assess this, I did this a couple ways. I compared the heights of the athletes' ASIS, their PSIS, and their iliac crest. And what I was looking for was just if one was higher, one was lower, or they were both even. So the last thing I did was the long sitting test with the Weber Barstow maneuver. And this was just used to assess for pelvic rotation. And it would show whether one was unilaterally um, anteriorly rotated or posteriorly rotated. <coughs> and here are some pictures from the ASIS. So here you can see that their left was higher than their right here. This one's a good one. Left is a lot higher than his right ASIS. And this one's a little harder to see, but left is also higher than the right. And all three of these athletes did suffer from an upper leg injury. This is their PSIS, and both of theirs, their left was higher than their right. This one's a little easier to tell. Um, this one, for some reason, the right looks higher, but the left was higher. And this was the long sitting. So, 
So it started, I had the athlete lace glass upon and their legs were out. And my thumbs were on the medial malleolus of the legs. And you can tell that they're not perfectly even, but they're pretty close. So after that, I brought the legs up and I had them do a bridge for about five seconds. And um, once they came down from the bridge, I passively flexed their hips here and then brought their legs back down. And as you can tell from this picture to this picture, my right thumb has moved down, which means the left leg has become longer and that side was posteriorly rotated. So for my results, 16 of the 27 uh, players suffered from an upper leg muscular injury. This was 59% of the soccer team. So of the 16, 10 had a pelvic malalignment, and this was 63%. So of those 10, 7 had an upper leg musculoskeletal injury that was on the same side as their pelvic malalignment. From the 10 up here, from the 6 that did not have a uh, pelvic malalignment, we had three that had a specific mechanism of injury. So that kind of ruled out those three for anything. So also back to the 10 that had a pelvic malalignment. There were nine that were posteriorly rotated and there was one that was anteriorly rotated. So analysis showed a significant correlation between pelvic malalignment, uneven true leg lengths, and unilateral pelvic rotation with injuries. Um, it also showed that there was no correlation between age, position, leg dominance, and number of years playing competitive soccer. And that kind of showed that overuse didn't have any influence on the injuries. And it was also, it's also important to note that when looking at the data for all the people who had no pelvic malalignment, there was only one athlete that reported an injury. And after we looked at him, we kind of found out that he had very tight musculature in his back, which was causing his pain. So what can be con concluded? Um, unilateral pelvic rotation does have an influence on upper leg musculoskeletal injuries in collegiate male soccer players. And like I just said, that overuse did not have an influence on the athletes who suffered an upper leg um, injury. So, any questions? Okay, so you tested just those that were hurt, or did you test everybody? I tested everyone. And 16 um, reported an upper leg injury, and then of those 16, only 10 had a total. No, I didn't. I, in the research, I did find it was running related injuries, and it was just said that anterior um, tilt kind of was prominent there, and, but that was just from tight musculature. So I didn't really find anything that was specific to soccer. So and I think that's kind of one of the big things that was important is that there is a big lack of research in this. consider a um, muscle imbalance between the quads and the hamstrings? I do not, I do not look at that. Um, I did look at the difference between kicking and non-kicking leg, and there was a little difference, but nothing that was significant. Um, I guess I have a question for you. From where you worked with soccer, have, did you, have you ever noticed anything dealing well, with this? Working with women's soccer, um, you know, every year we seem to have two or three uh, upper leg musculoskeletal injuries. Um, and, you know, that your research there honestly makes me think about going back and looking at that among women's soccer players. In the past, have you noticed anything? I I this year it was yeah. kind of like, wow. I'd say there's a strong anecdotal. I think it's one of those things that we just accept is that it's mm -hmm. a, a function of soccer, that the motions of it, and that they will have pelvic rotations. But it's just one of those things I don't think it's in the, it's in the literature yet. But everybody that's worked with soccer notices it.
And also maybe something to look at turf <laughs> compared to regular grass too. So. Now, did you say uh, your injuries were on the same side of the malware? There were seven that seven of the ten. Mm -hmm. So most of them, yes. So. Any other questions? Do you plan on educating teams about stretching techniques or anything like that to fix the malware? Well, I mean, I think for you all, y'all do a pretty good like pre-exercise or pre-stretch and post-stretch for practice, but. I mean, yeah, I think it would be informative for all teams to do that and hope to eliminate some of these injuries.